Hi, my name is Chanakya Damarla, and I'm going to talk about how we can upgrade AWS Glue to use lake formation permissions. In this presentation, I'm going to go over the motivation for why we created a new security model, why we created the lake formation security model, how you can use the lake formation security model to authorize access to your metadata, how you can unify access to your S3 data locations um, with metadata access, and then if the demo gods permit, we'll actually go through an entire process where we upgrade an existing data catalog that's using IAM permissions um, to start using lake formation permissions. So why do we create a new security model? Why do we create a new, um, why do we create the lake formation security model? In the past, decision making really used to revolve around the enterprise data warehouse. It was all about getting data, nice, clean, structured data from your online transaction processing systems, your line of business systems, your ERP and CMR, CRM systems into the enterprise data warehouse and making sure that you could populate some dashboards in time for when the executive walked in at 7 in the morning so they had insights into what was happening with their business. But the reality is now data no longer fits that model. Organizations simply have a lot more data than what's contained inside those, um, inside those um, databases. They have a lot of structured, semi-structured, and completely unstructured data. For example, they have log files that contain what people are doing in real time on their website. They have IoT streaming data that's coming in from connected devices um, across um, their enterprise. They have video imagery. They have, um, for example, satellite imagery that organizations are dealing with. So organizations are dealing with a lot more data, and the data that they're dealing with is much more diverse. In addition to that, organizations want to be able to do more and more things with that data. While in the past, everything primarily, be used, primarily used to revolve around making sure your business users had their dashboards populated in time, now, more and more use case, data is being used to um, drive more and more use cases. For example, data scientists want to be able to create machine learning models um, using the organization's data. Scientists want to be able to create or do better scientific analysis so they can understand, for example, the best way um, where you can find oil in oil fields. And finally, we're also seeing an increase in real-time applications. Applications wanting to be able to reach out to customers in real time, for example, suggesting the next thing to buy or the next video um, to watch on their particular website. In response to the different workloads or the broader workloads that organizations are facing, there's really been the idea of democratizing data access inside an organization. And so while organizations are trying to democratize data access, the other reality of what they have to deal with is that they have to comply with the regulations and governance uh, requirements um, for all the different countries that they um, operate in. We're all familiar with GDPR, CCPA, and so forth, and these are all regulatory regimes that multinational companies have to remain compliant with. As a result, data lake architectures are increasingly replacing data warehouses. In a data lake architecture, all an organization's data, both structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data, resides in a cost-efficient and durable storage system. In the Amazon stack, that is Amazon S3. This provides a very cost-effective storage for all the data inside your organization. Then, they want to be able to bring the correct tool for the specific job that they happen to be um, working on. So for example, Amazon Athena, if you want to do SQL analytics, SageMaker, if you want to build a machine learning model, Redshift and Redshift Spectrum, if you want to take data that exists inside your data lake and join it, for example, with data inside your um, data warehouse. And managing or em enabling uh, the separation between compute and storage is really the data catalog. And the data catalog is providing a mapping between the logical model that your compute services are using in a nice logical model like databases, tables, and columns. And it's mapping that to how the data is actually organized in S3 or the physical model of how the data is laid out in S3. 
right? The fundamental problem, though, is that by separating out compute and storage, in order to meet your regulatory requirements, you need to be able to set up permissions once and have those permissions apply across all the compute services and tools. You really do need a single locus of control where permissions and access control can be set up on the data catalog and those permissions apply to your compute services as well as um, manage access to your S3 locations. Remember, our customer's frame of reference is database management style system permissions, right? They simply granted and revoked access to specific tables or specific columns to their um, users. For customers that, were used, that had that as their frame of reference, managing permissions across the entire stack is very, very difficult. They now have to manage security policies for your compute services. What is a user allowed to do? Do they have administrative access? Can they spin up a new Redshift Spectrum cluster? Um, can they only query using Redshift? Um, they have to manage access to the data catalog as well as the S3 locations. Needless to say, customers found this sometimes to be difficult and cumbersome. It was hard or difficult to sometimes set up um, compliant policies, manage change, um, audit data access, and verify compliance. What's really required is simplified permission model. And that's exactly what AWS Lake Formation um, security model does. The Lake Formation security model introduces two primary levers that customers can use to implement database management style permissions to govern access or authorize access to their metadata and data. First, we implement a new permissioning system that authorizes access to metadata. And second, we introduce temporary credential vending that unifies access to S3 with permissions on your metadata. I'm going to go into details on both of these parts shortly, but before we do, a quick overview of what our design goals were. We wanted to have a single data catalog. We did not want there to be two separate data catalogs because a separate data catalog would remove or um, make it impossible to have a central locus of control. We did not want any forced data or metadata state migrations. And we wanted customers to be able to incrementally adopt lake formation permissions and migrate to using lake formation permissions when it was convenient for them to do so. The entire purpose of the lake formation permissioning system is to introduce intuitive permissioning model that governs access to your compute services as well to your metadata and your S3 um, locations, right? And finally, we wanted there to be no business disruption. We did not want you to have to stop your data catalog or upgrade your data catalog. We simply wanted you to migrate your permissions as it was convenient for you. Let's go on to how we, you can secure uh, access to metadata. In order to understand what lake formation does, let's look at what happens to an API call um, before the introduction of lake formation. Before the introduction of lake formation, every single API call and request was first authenticated. And authenticated simply means that this call has to be, you have to be able to identify the principal that's initiating this call. You typically did this by either knowing the password for your particular login account, having the secret key that you were using to sign your API requests, or via SAML assertions that you were sending as a part um, of that request. Once a call was authenticated, it then went through IAM authorization. And what this meant was that IAM was going to authorize access to that particular API call or that, and that particular resource. And this was typically set up using, the, uh, using IAM policies or resource policies and tag-based policies. Only when a call passed both authentication and authorization did the call get access to the underlying data resources. With lake formation, you still have the same authentication and authorization mechanisms. So calls are still authenticated. You still have to identify your principal. 
then those calls go through IAM authorization exactly as before. So you still need IAM policies giving you, granting you access to specific resources and API calls. But what's different is now, in addition to IAM authorization, these calls also require lake formation authorization. And this lake formation, then, is an additional layer of authorization onto your metadata. And lake formation permissions are granted um, via the console or APIs. And I'll walk through how that works later in this presentation. Right? So only after a call has been authenticated, authorized by IAM, and authorized by lake formation, does the principal actually get access to the underlying metadata. So let's look at what this actually means. Right? With lake formation, first, lake formation and AWS Glue use the exact same data catalog. They're one and the same. What's different is that now both IAM and lake formation permissions are being used to authorize access to the metadata. In the previous world, it was just IAM permissions that were governing access to metadata. With the introduction of lake formation, you now have IAM permissions as well as lake formation permissions. But we don't want you to set up corresponding IAM policies and lake formation policies. The recommended usage is more like what I have on the right here, to have coarse-grained IAM permissions and fine-grained lake formation permissions. And we're going to walk through what this actually looks like in practice. Right? When we talk about coarse-grained IAM policies, what we really mean is look at what's happening here. Here you're saying this user or this policy is granting this principle that this policy is attached to access to each one of these resources, and you're listing them out by one by one by one. Instead of doing that, we want you to go towards a world where you're able to define these policies um, in a more um, coarse, at a higher level of granularity or more coarse granularity. For example, giving access to all the tables inside the legislator's database using IAM policies and using lake formation to restrict um, access. Lake formation security policies are a triple. They consist of three major things. First is the lake formation principle. And this is typically an IAM principle, for example, an IAM user or an IAM role, or an Active Directory user and group, or group. Those principles are given permissions on a specific resource, and in lake formation, the types of resources that principles can be given permissions on are locations, catalog, database, table, and columns. And then the specific permissions are based on the resource that we're giving the permission on. For example, on location, you can only provide a data location access permission. On the catalog, you can have a permission to create databases within that catalog. On a database, you can create tables within that database or alter and drop the database. On a table, you can alter or drop the table. Or there's permissions to be able to select, insert, and delete um, from that table. And finally, on a column, you can select from that column. The asterisks here mean that those are also data access permissions. It means that if you have these permissions, lake formation um, may also vend temporary credentials to those tables or columns um, based on if the location is um, registered or not. Right? There's some cases, we talked about lake formation wanting to create a simplified permissioning system. And so instead of making you specify every single thing, um, there's some cases where it makes sense to be able to infer permissions and explicitly um, provide those inferred permissions. For example, if you have access to a table, you most likely should be able to view the table metadata. You most likely should be able to list the database that that table exists inside. And you most likely should be able to read the data location if you have select access um, on a table. And so we make a couple of these type of inferences, but we explicitly set those permissions in lake formation. The first is based on your role. If you're an administrator, we know that you want, we know that um, 
you most likely need to be able to look at all the things inside your data lake. So we will give you permissions to list all locations, databases, and tables within your data lake. We also give you the permission as an administrator to be able to grant any permission on any location, database, and table within the data lake. <clears throat> if you're the creator of an object, for example, a database or a table, we know that you probably should have all permissions on that particular table and so, or database. And so we give creators of databases and tables all permissions with the ability to grant those permissions to other users. In the same way, they can also list the databases and tables that they created. Some permissions are hierarchical, and we make sure that we give you permissions up the hierarchical structure, right? So the, met the metadata is inherently hierarchical. Databases are contained within catalogs, tables are contained within databases, and columns are contained within tables. As a result, when you get a permission on an object, you get the ability to list the par the, all the object's parents. So if you get a permission on a column, you get the ability to list the column, the table that that column is contained in. You get the ability to list the database that that table is contained in, and you have access to the data catalog that that database is in. Typically, in order to associate a table with, or a date, in order to associate a location with a table or a database, users are going to require location permissions to that particular location. Okay, and we'll talk about location permission in the next section uh, when we talk about um, S3 permissions. However, in case you have the create table permission on a database, and that database has a location specified with it, then this create table permission will allow you to create table will allow you to create tables at any child location of the database's location. So this is another sort of simplification um, that we just uh, give to you. And similarly, we make some inferences based on the scope of the operation. For example, if you can select from a table, it means that you should be able to read from the uh, from you should be able to read the table's data from S3. If you have insert and delete on a table, it means that you should be able to write to the table's location in S3. In a similar way, it doesn't make sense to be able, some operations like insert and delete only can be granted on all the columns within a um, table. You can't grant insert um, on, partial, um, on partial rows. We spoke about how Lake Formation introduced a new authorization mechanism um, or an authorization layer to the metadata. However, it does not break your existing glue usage. Lake Formation is backward compatible. At the launch of Lake Formation, we set it up so that it would enforce your existing IAM policies. Let's go through how this actually works. This is what the world looked like before Lake Formation. You had IAM permissions that were governing access to the metadata. In this particular case, this user has access to just the members table of the legislator's database. When Lake Formation launched, it introduced a new permission that would authorize access to the metadata. However, no individual user had any of these permissions set. Instead, what we did was implement a Lake Formation pass-through permission. And that was implemented by giving a permission called super to a group called IAM Allowed Principles. IAM Allowed Principles is anybody that first passed authentication and IAM authorization. So it's all principles that were authorized by IAM. And for those users, we gave a permission called super that is basically the union of all permissions inside the system. And so what this does is it basically passes through your existing IAM permissions. If IAM authorizes access to a specific metadata object, lake formation, because since IAM authorized access, <coughs> the principal is already a member of IAM allowed principals. There's a super permission that's associated with that particular principal, so only what IAM allowed access to um, is um, being passed through. You will upgrade to use lake formation permissions by first granting individual 
lake formation permissions, revoking the lake formation pass-through permission, and then setting up coarse grain IAM permissions. And we'll walk through an example of how all of this is set up um, and how you would actually go through and do this um, later in this presentation. Right? Let's move on to how you can secure access to the underlying data in S3. Lake formation unifies metadata and data access with credential vending. For locations that have been registered with lake formation, lake formation can vend temporary credentials to access those locations. Integrated services, for example, Athena, Glue, EMR, um, and Retro Spectrum can request these temporary credentials on behalf of users and use those temporary credentials to actually access the underlying S3 locations. So the expected usage is that you upgrade to use lake formation permissions first by granting lake formation permissions, revoking the lake formation pass-through permission, and utilizing coarse-grained IAM permissions. Then you give each of your users the get data access permission and register the location. And finally, you can optionally lock down S3 permissions. We say optionally here because some users have the use case where they want to be able to access S3 via either the console uh, or API access, and so you need to make the decision on an individual user by user basis. But for majority of your users, it should be possible to lock down S3 permissions uh, so they are only accessing the underlying data using Lake Formation's temporary credentials. Let's walk through how this actually looks like, what this actually looks like. Let's suppose that you're a user and you want to use Athena to query, in this particular case, the member's database. So you um, send the query select star from legislators.members. In this particular case, Athena will first get the table legislators.members and Lake Formation will send back the schema for that particular table and include with it a Boolean that tells you if this location is registered or not, along with the list of authorized data columns or authorized columns for this particular user. If the location is not registered, Athena will simply try to access S3 using the user's credentials. If the location is registered, then Athena will ask Lake Formation for temporary credentials to be able to access that particular location. Lake Formation will return short-term credentials for that particular table location. This will be because of lake formation authorization, meaning the user has either select, insert, or delete one of the data access permissions on that particular table. Then Athena will request access to um, those locations from S3. S3 will return the objects from that particular location. And now Athena has access to the data, so it will actually run the query filter the columns, and return the results to the end user. So far, we've spoken about how, you, how Lake Formation provides a new authorization layer to access metadata inside the system, and how registering locations allows Lake Formation to vend temporary credentials to um, integrated services. There's one other permission that we need to talk about, and that's data location permissions. You need to explicitly grant data location permissions to users. When you're creating a database or a table, it is possible to associate a location with it. Right? This is where the data for that particular database or table is actually going to reside within your data lake. But every user can't set up, can't point, create databases and tables that point anywhere inside the data lake. As a result, you have to explicitly give users permissions to create databases and tables within specific S3 locations inside the data lake, right? For example, in this particular case, it would be difficult to say, hey, anyone can create a table inside finance um, bucket or anyone can create a table um, inside the engineering bucket. We don't want that to happen. As a result, users have to get data location access permissions to those particular locations and that's what enables them to actually associate 
um, location, those locations with um, databases and tables when they create them. Now, we'll walk through an example of upgrading a Glue Data Catalog to start using lake formation permissions. The starting point for our demo is going to be this. We're going to have two users, Jack and Jill, and they're being set, they've been given IAM permissions in the following manner. Jack has permissions to the legislator's database and the member's table inside it, and Jill has um, IAM permissions to the legislator's database and the person's table and the events table inside it. They also have access to the corresponding S3 locations. As a result, Jack has access, metadata access to legislators' members, as well as S3 permissions to where the data resides, and Jill has access to the legislators' persons and events tables, as well as where the um, data for those two tables reside. Lake Formation introduced a new permissioning system. And when we launched Lake Formation, for the purposes of backward compatibility, Lake Formation implemented Lake Formation pass-through, which was we gave the permission called super to all IAM allowed principles. The expression granting permissions to or authorizing access to the metadata then is your existing IAM permissions and either the Lake Formation pass-through permission, which we're going to denote as S2I in the, these slides, or individual Lake Formation permissions that may have been configured. Because S2I is on, this portion of the expression always evaluates to true. As a result, only your IAM permissions are governing access or authorizing access to the metadata. So Jack still has access to the metadata. Legislators members table, and the underlying S3 locations, and Jill still has access to the persons and events tables and the underlying S3 location. Now, we'll walk through how to actually upgrade to using lake formation permissions. And we spoke about how this consisted of five parts. First, you grant individual lake formation permissions. Second, you revoke the lake formation pass-through. Third, you utilize coarse-grained IAM permissions. Fourth, enable get data access and register the location. And finally, if you choose, optionally lock down access to um, the S3 locations. Let's look at the first step, which is how you go about granting lake formation permissions. Remember, the expected usage is to set up coarse-grained IAM permissions and fine-grained lake formation permissions. But you have to set up the fine-grained lake formation permissions first, because if you set up coarse-grained IAM permissions, you're going to give IAM access to a lot of uh, tables that you may not necessarily want to provide access to. You have a couple of different ways to figure out what lake formation permissions you need to set up. The first is you can review your IAM policies and say, hey, based on the IAM policies, it looks like these users need the following lake formation permissions. Alternatively, you can look inside your cloud trail data because whenever you try to access metadata, metadata inside the data catalog, remember those calls are first authenticated and IAM authorized. They're also going through lake formation authorization. But in the case that S2I or the lake formation pass-through permission is on, lake formation will basically log into cloud trail every time there's insufficient lake formation permissions. So it's basically telling you, hey, I'm allowing this call to go through because S2I is on and you have the required IAM authorization. But if you want to set up lake formation permissions for this particular access, this is the specific permission that you need to set up. So I'm actually going to show you how, what those permission, what those logs look like and how we can set up the corresponding permissions in the next couple of slides. So we'll set up our lake formation permissions then. The expression granting access is still IAM permissions and S2I or lake formation permissions. Remember, S2I is still on, so this portion of the expression still is going to evaluate the true. That means your IAM permissions are going to apply, and so Jack is still going to have access to the members table, and Jill is still going to have access to the persons and events table. Let's look at how we can find insufficient 
lake formation permissions. It's possible to query your CloudTrail data, uh, and you're basically looking for an additional event field called insufficient lake formation permissions. I'm going to switch over to Athena now, uh, and I'm going to show you the specific query that you can use um, to set this up. Great. So I've logged into my Athena console, and this is the query that I'm looking for. And the query is very straightforward. I'm basically looking for the event name and additional event data. And inside the additional event data, I want to find all items that have insufficient lake formation permissions. So these are all the items inside CloudTrail where, we, where lake formation has basically said, hey, I'm authorizing access to this because S2I is on, but you do not have the corresponding individual lake formation permissions configured. When you run this query, I've also put in additional items, uh, filled, um, where additional parts of the where clause here. For example, I'm only looking for the data associated with Jack and Jill right now. And you will see that there's four items that came up. It says user Jill needs access to persons.json, and user Jack needs access to membership.json, and user Jill needs access to events, uh, um, events.json. So what we can do by looking at this is now we, can we know what permissions need to be set up. So let's actually go through and set up those permissions inside Lake Formation. So I'm going to switch over to the Lake Formation console now. Simply go to Data Permissions, and I'm going to Grant Access. Right? So for the user Jack, I'm going to grant access to the legislator's database, to the table, members, and we're going to give them select access to all the columns inside that particular table, and we select grant. It's that simple. We've configured lake formation permissions for Jack to the legislator's members table. In a similar way, we're going to set up lake formation permissions for Jill to the database legislators. And the two tables for her are events and persons. And we're also going to give her select permissions. Let's verify it was events and persons. Go back to Athena. Jill needs access to persons and Jill needs access to events. It's true. So these permissions are correct. So user Jill is getting access to the legislator's database and the events and persons table, and she's being given select access. Let's grant those permissions. Perfect. And that was it. And so we've been able to identify, based on the insufficient lake formation permissions in CloudTrail, what permissions users needed access to. And then we use the console to set up those permissions to the users Jack and Jill. Now let's switch back to the PowerPoint presentation and I'll walk through uh, the rest of the upgrade process. So we showed how to find what permissions should be set up for our users and we granted those permissions. We granted those lake formation permissions to both Jack and Jill so far. Now let's go through and revoke the lake formation permission. What does that mean? We've set up, this is the world we have right now. These were the permissions. We've set up corresponding lake formation permissions. So we've set up Jack to have permissions to the members table, and we've set up Jill to have permissions to the persons and the events table. What we need to do now is revoke the lake formation pass-through permission or the S2I, right? And the reason we're doing this is that remember, the expression authorizing access to the metadata is still IAM permissions and S2I or lake formation permissions. S2I is now going to be revoked, so that portion of the expression is always going to, um, uh, is always going to evaluate to zero. Um, and so this entire portion of the expression is not always going to be true. But because you have the exact same IAM permissions and lake formation permissions, they're always going to be true whenever um, IAM permissions are true right now. 
So the user is still going to have access to the members table. Um, sorry, Jack is still going to have access to the members table, and Jill is still going to have access to the persons and events table. In order to revoke the lake, forma uh, lake formation pass through on the databases and tables, we're simply going to switch back to the screen, um, to the presentation, to the demo screen, and we'll revoke the super permission from IAM allowed principles. We will also revoke um, use only IAM permissions um, from the database, and we'll revoke the lake formation permissions on the data catalog. Let's go through and do that. So switching over to um, the presentation, uh, switching over to the demo. Great. Inside the demo, you can see that the table events.json does in fact have IAM allowed principles and this print IAM allowed principles does have the super permission. So what we want to do now is we want to revoke all of these permissions. Right. In order to revoke this permission, it's fairly straightforward. Click here. Click on the revoke button. It's saying I am allowed principles. Super. We're going to revoke the super permission from I am allowed principles um, for the table events.json. So we'll revoke. Great. We also want to do this from the table for members. So we'll revoke on the members table the super permission from IAM allowed principles. In the same way, we need to do this from the persons table. So we're revoking from the persons table uh, the super permission from I am allowed principle. And I'm just going to go through and do this for each of the tables inside legislators. So for areas.json, we're removing the area, um, super permission from I am, that, um, I am allowed principles. Exact same thing for countries. Now organizations. Great. So for each of the tables inside legislators, right? Areas, countries, events, members, organizations, and persons, we've removed IAM, um, we've removed the super permission from the IAM allowed principles. At the same time, you can also change a couple of other settings. Um, specifically, uh, we'll set up the data catalog um, to not use, um, to not have um, lake, pass through lake formation permissions. We've revoked the lake formation pass through permission. Switching back to the presentation, let's walk through the rest of the upgrade process. The next step is really utilizing coarse-grained IAM permissions. So at this point, we've set up fine-grained lake formation permissions that mimic your IAM permissions. And so because the lake formation permissions mimic your IAM permissions, it's now possible to open up or use utilize coarse-grained IAM permissions, right? So the expression granting access is still IAM permissions and uh, lake formation pass-through or S2I or individual lake formation permissions. And what we're going to do now is make the IAM permissions portion of this always true, meaning we're going to utilize coarse-grained IAM permissions. And because of that, because individual lake formation permissions are set up, even though the IAM permissions portion of this expression is always true, Jack will still only have access to the members table and Jill will still only have access to the persons and events table. 
What utilizing coarse grain IAM permissions means is that we're actually going to go into the IAM policies for these users and we're going to change those policies. So instead of granting access on specific tables, um, we're going to grant um, access on star. For the purposes of this demo, I'm simply going to be I'm simply going to be granting access on star, but it'll be useful. Um, we recommend you to use the proper um, granularity um, when you're doing the upgrade process. I'll switch over to the demo now and show you how that works. So I have my IAM console open, and let's inspect the policies we have for the user Jack. Jack has a policy giving him permissions on the data catalog, and you can see that it's giving him permissions to the legislator's database and the member's table inside that database. In order to utilize coarse-grained policies, what we're going to do is we're going to remove the individual resources Jack is being given permissions on, and we're going to replace it with the coarse grain policy, in this particular case, star. So let's detach this policy from Jack. And I've already created a managed policy for the purposes of this demo uh, that grants full access, and we're going to add that particular policy. In order to do that, let's find that policy. It's called catalog all access. So we've removed the catalog access for just the members table, and we've added catalog access to every single or star inside um, this particular data catalog um, associated with US East 2 um, and this particular account. So we've set up coarse-grained policies for Jack. And now we'll do the exact same thing for Jill. Jill has catalog policies giving her access just to the events and persons table. We're going to detach this policy from Jill. And we're going to add the all access policy for Jill. Excellent. So let's review it. So Jill used to have policy, um, catalog access policy granting her just access to the ta two tables she had access to events and persons. She now is utilizing coarse grain policy that grants us her access to star. Jack used to have fine grain policy granting access just to the members table. And now we've set it up so he has access to star. And let's verify that this is actually working by using Athena. So it's inside Athena. I've now logged on as Jack. We'll refresh the database table. He has access to the legislator's database, and you can see that he only has access, even though from an IAM perspective, it looked like he had a coarse grain policy granting him access to everything inside legislators. You can see that he only has access to the memberships um, table. In a similar way, let's preview the table because it's interesting what's actually happening here. Here, it's lake formation permissions granting access to the table, but it's actually Jack's underlying S3 permissions because we haven't registered the location yet uh, that's allowing Athena to query the um, underlying S3 locations. In a similar way, let's see what's happening with Jill. Jill has access to the legislator's database. And we only gave Jill access to the events and persons table. And sure enough, Jill can only see the events and persons table. And again, we'll do the query here. But what's interesting here again for Jill is that she's using coarse grain IAM policies. But she's only able to see these two tables because of the fine-grained lake formation permissions that have been set up. So, so far, what we've done is we've set up individual lake formation permissions. We've revoked 
the lake formation pass-through permission or the S2I permission on all the tables inside the legislator's database. And we've set up coarse-grained IAM policies for both Jack and Jill. Let's go back to the presentation and walk through the rest of the upgrade process. So the next step in the upgrade process is to enable get data access or to add the get data access policies for both Jack and Jill, and then we'll register the location, right? So in order to do this, what we're actually doing is we're going to unify metadata access with data access by registering the locations. But just because you register the location doesn't mean that users are going to be able to get access to the data from that location. They need a permission to do that, and that permission is basically get data access. So we'll go through and set that up. But before you register a location, it's important that you audit all the resources that are pointing to that particular location and make sure that you have all the permissions set up for all the resources that are pointing to that particular uh, location. Other, because when you, once you register a location, integrated services will use lake formation credentials to access that location. So it is possible that you might break existing usage. So it's important to review your insufficient lake formation permissions at the granularity of the location you're getting ready to register. And you have to set up uh, get data access permissions on those users. So we'll go through, we'll switch back over to the demo and we'll set up get data access for both Jack and Jill and we'll register the location. And you should see that everything will still work. And then finally, we'll remove S3 access from the um, Jack and Jill, and you'll see that everything um, still works. They still have, they can still use Athena to access only the tables that they have access to. So I'm going to switch over to the demo now, and we'll take it from there. Back to my IAM console. The first thing that we're going to do is set up the get data access permission for both Jack and Jill. And I've set up a managed policy for the purposes of this demo that I'm going to attach that simply says get data access. Okay. And all this permission is doing is it's giving the lake formation get data access to that user. So for Jack, I'm going to attach that policy. Review, add permissions. And for Jill, I'm going to attach that policy. So, so far, we've enabled Jack and Jill to be able to use the temporary credentials from lake formation. However, because the, lake form because the location has not been registered with lake formation, Jack and Jill won't um, need to um, use the temporary credentials. So let's go to lake formation and actually register the location. In order to do that, you simply go to data lake locations, register location, and we'll browse for CMH legislators, select, and we'll review the location permissions. It's critical that you go through this step to understand what are all the resources that are pointing to the location you're getting ready to register. Because as soon as you register the location, lake formation will start vending temporary credentials to those particular locations. and Integrated services like Athena will ask for those temporary credentials on behalf of users. So we'll review it. It looks like everything is okay in this case, and we'll register the location. So now what's happening is Jack and Jill have the get data access permission, and the location has been registered. So when they go to Athena, these queries are still going to work. But what's actually happening in the background is that Athena is getting temporary credentials to the S3 locations 
and accessing S3 using those temporary credentials on behalf of, in this case, Jack and Jill. Right. The final step in the upgrade process is to remove direct access to S3 from both Jack and Jill. And so that's what I'm going to do. And then we'll verify that Athena is still able to perform these queries appropriately. So let's go back to the IAM console and let's go to Jack. So Jack had access to get data access. He has coarse grain IAM permissions for the data catalog and he had S3 permissions to the member's location. Let's review it, right? And this was the policy that was granting Jack access to the member's location in S3. We're simply going to remove this policy. We're going to detach this policy from Jack. In the exact same way, we'll go and remove the policy, her, uh, Jill's S3 policy. Jill had policy that was granting her access to events and persons, um, locations for events and persons. We're going to remove this policy from Jill. So now Jill only has the get data access permission, coarse grain IAM permissions on the entire data catalog, and limited Athena per policy that basically allows her to use Athena. But because Jill has get data access and this location has been registered, these queries should still work. So we'll log back into Athena as Jill. And let's see if these queries still work. And sure enough, they do. And the exact same way, the query should also work for Jack. Let's just run the query again. So now I'll switch back over to the presentation because we're done with the demo and we'll talk about what we've just seen. So we concluded the demo, but let's talk about what we actually did. In the upgrade process, so far, we've granted individual lake formation permissions. We've revoked the lake formation pass-through permission. We utilized coarse grain IAM permissions, and we enabled get data access for both Jack and Jill, and we registered the location. What this actually meant is that we unified metadata access with data access by registering locations so lake formation could vend temporary credentials. Remember, we did not, we removed the S3 permissions from both Jack and Jill. So what was giving S3 permissions to Jack and Jill was lake formation temporary credentials. And in order for them to be able to use those temporary credentials, we gave them get the get data access permission. I've already shown you how to review location permissions. It's critical that you review location permissions because once a, once a location is registered, integrated services will use lake formation credentials. So this may break your existing usage. So review um, the permissions, review, um, review the permissions associated with locations you're getting ready to register. We've enabled get data access and using the console we registered the location. And for the purposes of this demo, we also locked down S3 permissions. Because lake formation can vent temporary credentials, you don't need direct access to S3 as long as you're using an integrated service. And so because we expect Jack and Jill are only going to use Athena to access the data, they don't need individual access. So we went to the console and we removed the policies granting both Jack and Jill access to S3. So they're only accessing S3 using the temporary credentials provided by Lake Formation. So in conclusion, we started here. We started in a world where everything was being governed or access to everything was being authorized by IAM permissions. Jack had IAM permissions giving him access to the members table. Jill had IAM permissions giving her access to the persons and the events table. They also had corresponding S3 permissions. We moved from this to this, where, oh, sorry. We moved from this to this, where we used coarse grain IAM permissions, fine grain lake formation permissions, 
and we lock down S3 permission group entirely. So it's only lake formation that's granting access to S3 locations. So in conclusion, we went through the entire upgrade process. And I think the main things that I want you to look at and understand about the upgrade process is that it worked at every single stage, at every single step. As we were going through the entire process, granting lake formation permissions, nothing broke, everything still worked. When we revoked, because we granted individual lake formation permissions, when we revoked um, LF pass-through, everything still worked. When we utilized coarse-grained IAM permissions, everything still worked. When we registered the location, everything still worked. And we removed the actual S3 policy, access policies, everything still worked. There was no data migration. There was no metadata or state migration. You simply migrated the permissions you wanted when you were ready. And the best part was that the data catalog was running the entire time. There were no disruptions. Thank you. Again, my name is Chanakya Damarla. I'm the principal product manager on AWS Lake Formation and AWS Glue. Uh, my contact information is here, uh, chanakyad at amazon.com. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out.